Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, so I'm Rob Karras, and I lead the national the NCATS program at DHS. And basically, under NCATS, there's uh, three branches. We have a cyber hygiene branch, which conducts vulnerability assessments. So we're out there um, scanning the internet, scanning uh, using NMAP, uh, commercial tools, uh, freely available tools. And we're packaging what we find on, on our customers. And our customers can be any, anybody from federal governments to uh, private sector to state and local governments. And we're packaging these reports and finding uh, vulnerabilities and sending them a weekly report. We have 691 customers right now. And every Monday, they get a report identifying their top vulnerabilities, what vulnerabilities they've closed, new hosts that we've identified, and uh, new ports that we've identified. Second service that we have is called operational resilience. And that's more a look at people's architecture. So we, we go in and we, we look at uh, people's architecture. We do a validated architecture review. We get PCAP data. And we map up the PCAP data to what we see on the architecture. So if we see data flowing from one segment of a network to, to another segment of the network, and they have firewalls or controls in there that say it's segmented, we point that out and we say, hey, maybe there's some configuration rules or some issues that you have here. And then the third program that is under me is called the Risk Evaluation Program. And under that is where we do risk and, risk and vulnerability assessments and we do penetration testing. That's what I'm going to talk to you today about and some of the results and, and what we're finding in there. So basically, we have two, two different assessments. We have a two-week assessment where we can, we, the first week we do all external and we try to break into um, a company from the outside. And then the second week, we go on site. Three or four, maybe five engineers go with their laptops and we're putting our laptops on their network. We're either acting as, as a trusted insider or an insider that, that broke in or, or some other kind of a threat that a company or agency wants to understand. But it, it, it's real hands-on keyboard. We're, we're uh, mimicking the, the adversary. So we're using a lot of tools and methods that, that they're using. Uh, most of the tools that we use are, are freeware and, and openware. We, we test them in our lab beforehand. And um, some of the results that we were seeing, um, the main, main way we get in is phishing, right? So uh, we, know it's, we know it's an issue. We're trying to, to uh, raise the bar and, and get technical controls. But what we're finding out is um, one, one of the cases that I'll, t I'll share it with you. So there, there's different sophistication levels. We'll, we'll send emails that look like they're coming from overseas with misspellings. People are, are pretty good at that. Um, we'll send stuff on a letterhead. They're not so good at that. But one of the uh, best ways and, and most common ways that we're getting in now is, is what we're calling um, solidified trust. So we try to identify people that are out of the office, and we'll send them an email. And so we'll find. John, who's out of the office, and we'll send him an email. Well, he gives us a nice reply that says, hey, I'm out of the office till March 24th, but please work with Mary or, or uh, Henry. So we take that information and we send Mary and Henry an email and say, hey, we've been working with John and we know he's out of the office, but we have this critical deadline that we have to meet. Can you help us or can you point us in the right direction? And nine out of nine times, 10 out of 10 times, the people are more than happy to help. Yeah, sure, you know, we know he's out, we know he's on vacation, uh, what, what do you need? And so we build this trust. Before we even send the phishing email um, with, with the attachment or the link, that trust is built. So we'll, we'll spend some time, um, four, five, six, seven emails building that trust, um, under, understanding uh, what, what it is and, and get, getting them to, to trust us before we send the, the Word document or PDF or whatever we're going to send. And sometimes um, the PDF doesn't work and it doesn't open. And we'll have people email us back and say, hey, we got this. And uh, there seemed to be some kind of a weird error, you know? <laughs> and we're like, oh, can you help us diagnose this? So people are actually helping us diagnose issues or bugs in, in, in our code in, in real time. And uh, it's just because humans, we're, we're, we're programmed that way. We're programmed to help. Um, second most common way that we're getting in is through usernames and passwords that we've uh, found through data breaches. So uh, Yahoo and LinkedIn are, are good, good examples. Um, so if my, my username and was, was hacked on, on LinkedIn, I, I used my private account there, but if I used robert.karras at dhs.gov on my LinkedIn account and my credentials there, my, my password of password, um, we, we scarf that information and then we try to log into the DHS VPN with that information. Oh, hey, we know robert.karras at dhs.gov and his password is x. Let's try to log in through VPN like that. We're seeing that over and over and over. And the Yahoo and LinkedIn data breaches are years old. So 
um, you know, password reuse and credentials um, it is a secondary way that we get in, and we're just seeing it over and over. So it goes just back to the methodology and mindset. Hey, you know, it, you know, people don't like to change their password every 90 days or 180 days or whatever the policy is, but um, we're, we're seeing that it's an effective way to get in, and if we're seeing it, I'm sure our adversaries are, are seeing it. Um, some of the uh, actual ways and examples, I want to I want to talk about other other examples. Um, uh, another phishing email, so. And, and these are examples that happened within the last two, two, two years, so some of them might be shocking and some of them might not be, but um, recently we sent an email to just three people in an agency. It was the CISO, it was the human capital or human resource lead, and I forget who the third person was, but it was saying, hey, you know, OPM has put out guidance on the new, new pay scale, you know, please, uh, please let everybody know. Well, the human capital person took it and sent it to everybody in the agency, which was about 1,800 people. And so our server was only expecting like one or two callbacks. We have over 400 callbacks. So <laughs> it crashed our server, but I mean, this happens. And, and then we had 400 potential victims that we, uh, we could attack. Um, another example is um, just, it was last summer, we were downtown DC. We're, we also conduct wireless assessments when, when we're on site. So we go around looking for, for rogue wireless access points or, or sometimes people actually have guest networks, wireless get, guest networks, and they say, hey, test this guest network and see if you could um, get over to our, our public or our private network, to, to our internal network, so we'll do that. But on this, this um, test, we were out there and we just noticed a, a rogue wireless access point. We're like, what is this? And, uh, we traced it down to somebody's office and it was buried under, it, it was like gym clothes or something. And uh, he just had a Linksys router that he brought from home and plugged it into the network. And we interviewed and we talked to the guy, we're like, well, why are you doing this? He's like, well, you know, I'm, I'm always down at Starbucks and I'm always working. And I'm like, are you, are you kidding me? But he wanted to continue working, so he would take his laptop down to Starbucks. He had no authentication, no encryption on that, on that wireless uh, point. So anybody down at Star Starbucks that could see that SID, was able to hop onto this uh, agency's network. So um, this is real life stuff that we're seeing and, and it's not, you know, 1998, we're, we're seeing it in, you know, 2017, 2016. Um, the third thing that I wanna um, bring to attention on this is um, we were doing a, a web application test and um, there's, there's a lot of good lessons that, that we've learned and, and people have learned, but there's still a lot of bad code out there. Um, and this one happened to be a password reset function on, on a web application, and the password reset function function worked great. Um, the only problem was is that if I knew the username, if the username was you know rkaris23 or whatever, I could put in any email address. I could put in um, anybody's email address, uh, tom at, at uh, verizon.com or something, and the password reset would email tom at verizon.com. So all you need to know is the username. You can put any any email address in there, and then you could set that reset that person's password. So that enabled us to log into that web application and then uh, do some various things. So um, there's web applications out there, and, and maybe people don't think about um, old code that's being used. And this this um, password reset was written seven years ago, and it, it functioned and it worked, but the person that developed it never thought that somebody would put in a wrong email address or, or a nefarious email address. So um, these are just some of the ideas and examples that I'm seeing. So what happens actually when we, we, we send a phishing email and then somebody clicks on it? Um, what do we do as, as a team after that? So just walk you through this graphical vis uh, visual. So we send the, we send the attack. And what we do is we dump something called um, the local account hash. So this is typically running in memory, um, and it, it's a, a local hash, and we get that. We say, hey, we have this hash. Now what can we do? We try to log into other, other boxes with this hash because, you know, the user's trusted on the network, and we do it until we find a box that actually has an admin account. And whoa, hey, now we're admin, but only admin on a local box. But typically those admins use the same credentials, so now we take those credentials, log into a domain controller, we own the whole enterprise. And from there we try to get to a database or, or some kind of data source that a company's trying to protect, and then we exfil the data out. Now, we don't actually exfil data, we, we replicate and make up mock data, but um, we, we um, exfil data over various protocols. We do it over FTP, over DNS, over HTTPS, over, over um, some other protocols, and typically, you know, um, 
three or four of those protocols will be blocked, but DNS and, and some others won't, and we're able to ex expel the expel the data. And then we just show the, the companies and the people that we do this for how we how we um, were able to do it, and then we show them, hey, this is how you mitigate this, and this is what what you need to do to mitigate it. So why do we do why do we do this, right? So we do this. Um, the companies and, and the agencies we work for, they get a great report. And it says how we got in, it gives them detailed reports, and this is how you mitigate it, and this is how you fix these risks. Uh, but DHS, we do it to, to gather the data and make sure that the data that we're get, gathering is apples to apples, so we can look at it and we can make informed decisions. So we, we have a rich uh, data source that says, hey, if you look at, you now we've done 350, uh, uh, risk and vulnerability assessments. If you look at this data, these are the trends that we're seeing, and these are the trends that we're seeing. So how do we inform our leadership um, in Congress to make policies and procedures that um, can fix some of these things? Um, we've been very successful at that. We've, uh, DHS has issued these uh, binding operational directives. Um, the first one was uh, binding operational directive 1501, which addressed critical uh, vulnerabilities. Um, I talked about cyber hygiene at the beginning of, of this the, uh, talk, and um, when, when we first started cyber hygiene, federal agencies, the closure rate to uh, fix critical vulnerabilities was over 340 days. So we, we'd identify a critical vulnerability, and we send a report off and say, hey, you know, Department X or Agency X, you have this critical vulnerability, and nothing was being done about it. So DHS issued a binding operational directive telling all agencies, departments and agencies, federal, that you have to fix these critical vulnerabilities in 30 days. So since that has gone out, the closure rate is under 10 days. So now when we find a critical vulnerability, we send out a report, the agencies close, close the, those critical vulnerabilities in under 10 days, which, which is a, a great, great thing. Um, state, local, and private sector, um, they're, they're behind. Their, their closure rates up into 30, 30s for um, private sector, and then for um, state and local, it's, it's in the 40s or 50s, and we're trying to work with them uh, to, to fix that, but DHS, we don't have the authority to, to tell them what to do, right? We just recommend, and we, we give them the reports, and they can do uh, what they want with the data. Um, those are a couple of the guys, actually, that, that work with, with me you know, in, the, in, in the office, so th those are some of the guys that are uh, conducting the penetration test. Um, the last binding operational directive was issued uh, last fall, and it had to do with uh, email and web security. And I've, you guys probably heard it on, on the radio about DMARC and SPF and fixing this. So there's, there's various marks. There's, there's a 90-day mark, 180-day mark, and then 365-day mark, where all federal departments and agencies have to have this implemented. So we're seeing an, an uptick, and, and we're seeing people work on it. it. It's a big problem to tackle because um, if you implement DMARC wrong, you'll actually do a denial of service on yourself. So um, it's taking department and agencies time, time to implement, and, and we're working with them. Uh, but we're scanning them, and we're seeing the closure rate um, uh, uh, increase, increase in people, people actually um, implementing that. Um, the final thing that I want to talk about is um, how we're helping. And, and one of the new concepts that we have is this uh, red team assessment that we're doing. It's a 90-day assessment, and it's a pen penetration test. And what we do is, uh, for the first three weeks, maybe two weeks, we do some open source intelligence on the agency, and then we figure out how we get into the agency. And we'll take DHS as, as an example. So when we uh, attack DHS, we try to find the, the weakest point, and whether you know that's in the uh, ICE network or the Secret Service network or the FEMA network, it, it doesn't matter. We'll, we'll fish all those, all those people. Um, uh, MPPD included, and we'll set up, uh, and you'll, you'll, you, you saw how we get in, and we pass the hash and get domain admin, and then we, we take over basically the whole network, and we see if anybody's identifying us, um, and a lot of times they're not identifying us. So then we'll do measurables and metrics. So we'll add user, users to, to the uh, enterprise. We'll add domain admins to the enterprise. We'll run vulnerability scans and see how their security operations center reacts, or if they don't react at all. And then at the end of the 90 days, we'll go on site for a few days and we'll train their security operations center and their security guys and say, this is exactly what we did. Where are your logs? How do, how do you log this? How would you, you identify this? And either they have it or they don't. Uh, either they noticed it or they didn't. But what we're trying to do is get closure rate on them identifying an adversary on their network. So the first time that we, we test them, 
the measurables and metrics, it might take them six weeks or eight weeks to notice us or, or never, but hopefully the second time we go back and test them, it'll take four weeks for them to notice, notice us. And then we go back the third time, it'll take two weeks and one week, and we'll close that because, um, you know, we don't know people on our network. How do we identify them? And this is gonna be one way that we're gonna be leading, leading the charge uh, to, to do that. So we're gonna be doing measurable metrics and training their operation centers to identify them. 